section sixteen chapters forty seven and forty eight of the three sisters by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty seven the train from durlingham rolled slowly into rayburn station gwenda carteret leaned from the window of a third-class carriage and looked up and down the platform she got out handing her suitcase to a friendly porter nobody had come to meet her they were much too busy up at the vicarage from the next compartment there alighted a group of six persons a lady in widow's weed an elderly lady and gentleman who addressed her affectionately as fanny dear and obviously belonging to the pair a very young man and a still younger woman there was also a much older man closely attached to them but not quite so obviously related these six people also looked up and down the platform expecting to be met they were interested in gwenda carteret they gazed at her as they had already glanced surreptitiously and kindly on the platform at durlingham now they seemed to be saying to themselves that they were sure it must be she gwenda walked quickly away from them and disappeared through the booking office into the station yard and then rowcliffe who had apparently been hiding in the general waiting-room came out on to the platform the six fell upon him with cries of joy and affection they were his mother his paternal uncle and aunt his two youngest cousins and dr harker his best friend and colleague who had taken his place in january when he had been ill they had all come down from leeds for rowcliffe's wedding rowcliffe's trap and peacock's from garthdale stood side by side in the station yard gwenda in peacock's trap had left the town before she heard behind her the clanking hoofs of rowcliffe's little brown horse she thought he will pass in another minute i shall see him but she did not see him all the way up rathdale to morf the sound of the wheels and of the clanking hoofs pursued her and rowcliffe still hung back he did not want to pass her well said peacock that beats me i should never have thought that, that old mare could have got away from the doctor's horse not if he'd had a mind to pass her no said gwenda she was thinking it's mary it's mary how could she when she knew when she was on her honour not to think of him and she remembered a conversation she had had with her stepmother two months ago when the news came robina had seized the situation at a glance and she had probed it to its core you wanted him to marry ally did you it wasn't much good your going away if you left him with mary but she had said mary knew and robina had answered marvellously you should never have let her it was her knowing that did it you were three women to one man and mary was the one without a scruple do you suppose she'd think of ally or of you either and she had tried to be loyal to mary and to rowcliffe she had said if we were three we all had our innings and he made his choice and robina it was mary did the choosing she had added that gwenda was a little fool and that she ought to have known that though mary was as meek as moses she was that sort she went on thinking to the steady clanking of the hoofs i suppose she said to herself she couldn't help it the lights of morfe shone through the november darkness the little slow mare crawled up the winding hill to the top of the green rowcliffe's horse was slower but no sooner had peacock's trap passed the doctor's house on its way out of the village square than the clanking hoofs went fast rowcliffe was free to go his own pace now which of you two is going to hook me up said mary she was in the vicar's room putting on her wedding gown before the wardrobe glass her two sisters were dressing her i will said gwenda you'd better let me said alice i know where the eyes are gwenda lifted up the wedding veil and held it ready and while alice pulled and fumbled mary gazed at her own reflection and at alice's you should have done as mummy said and had your frock made in london like gwenda they'd have given you a decent cut you look as if you couldn't breathe my frock's all right said alice her fingers trembled as she strained at the hooks and eyes and in the end it was gwenda who hooked mary up while alice held the veil she held it in front of her the long streaming net shivered with the trembling of her hands the wedding was at two o'clock the church was crowded so were the churchyard and the road beside the vicarage and the bridge over the beck morfe and greffington had emptied themselves into garthdale greffington had lent its organist it was only when it was all over that somebody noticed that jim greatorex was not there with the village choir 
celebrating a bit too early somebody said and it was only when it was all over that rowcliffe found gwenda he found her in the long flat pause the half hour of profoundest realization that comes when the bride disappears to put off her wedding gown for the gown she will go away in she had come out to the wedding party gathered at the door to tell them that the bride would soon be ready rowcliffe and harker were standing apart at the end of the path by the door that led from the garden to the orchard he came toward her harker drew back from the orchard they followed him and found themselves alone for ten minutes they paced the narrow flagged path under the orchard wall and they talked quickly like two who have but a short time well so you've come back at last at last i haven't been gone six months you see time feels longer to us down here that's odd it goes faster anyhow you're not tired of london she stared at him for a second and then looked away oh no i'm not tired of it yet they turned shall you stop long here i'm going back to-morrow to-morrow you're so glad to get back then so glad to get back i only came down for mary's wedding he smiled you won't come for anything but a wedding a funeral might fetch me well gwenda i can't say you look as if london agreed with you particularly i can't say you look as if garthdale agreed very well with you i'm only tired tired to death i'm sorry i want a holiday and i'm going to get one for a month you look as if you'd been burning the candle at both ends if you'll forgive my saying so oh for all the candles i burn it isn't such awfully hard work you know what isn't what i'm doing he stopped straight in the narrow path and looked at her i say what are you doing she told him his face expressed surprise and resentment and a curious wonder and bewilderment but i thought i thought they told me you were having no end of a time tunbridge wells isn't very amusing no more is lady frances again he stopped dead and stared at her but they told me i mean i thought you were in london with mrs carteret all the time she laughed did papa tell you that no i don't know who told me i i got the impression he almost stammered i must have misunderstood she meditated it sounds awfully like papa he simply can't believe poor thing that i'd stick to anything so respectable ha huh. he laughed out his contempt for the vicar he had forgotten that he too had wondered chuck it gwenda he said chuck it i can't she said not yet it's too lucrative but if it makes you seedy it doesn't it won't it isn't hard work only she broke off it's time for you to go steve steve rowcliffe's youngest cousin was calling from the study window come along mary's ready all right he shouted i'm coming but he stood still there at the end of the orchard under the gray wall good-bye stephen gwenda put out her hand he held her with his troubled eyes he did not see her hand he saw her eyes only that troubled his i say is it very beastly no not a bit you must go stephen you must go if i'd only known he persisted they were going down the path now toward the house i wouldn't have let you you couldn't have stopped me it was what she had always said to all of them she smiled you didn't stop me going you know if you'd only told me she smiled again a smile as of infinite wisdom dear stephen there was nothing to tell they had come to the door in the wall it led into the garden he opened to let her pass through the wedding party was gathered together on the flagged path before the house it greeted them with laughter and cries cheerfully ironic the bride in her travelling dress stood on the threshold outside the carriage waited at the open gate rowcliffe took mary's hand in his and they ran down the path he can sprint fast enough now said rowcliffe's uncle but his youngest cousin and harker his best friend had gone faster they were waiting together on the bridge and the girl had a slipper in her hand were you ever she said at such an awful wedding harker saw nothing wrong about the wedding but he admitted that his experience was small the youngest cousin was not appeased by his confession she went on why on earth didn't stephen try to marry gwenda not much good trying said the doctor if she wouldn't have him you believe that silly story i don't did you see her face harker admitted that he had seen her face and then as the carriage passed rowcliffe's youngest cousin did an odd thing she tossed the slipper over the bridge into the beck 
harker had not time to comment on her action they were coming for him from the house rowcliffe's youngest sister-in-law had fainted away on the top landing everybody remembered then that it was she who had been in love with him chapter forty eight alice had sent for gwenda three months had gone by since her sister's wedding and all her fears were gathered together in the fear of her father and of what was about to happen to her and before gwenda could come to her rowcliffe and mary had come to the vicar in his study they had been a long time with him and then rowcliffe had gone out they had sent him to upthorne and the two had gone into the dining-room and they had her before them there it was early in a dull evening in february the lamps were lit and in their yellow light ally's face showed a pale and quivering exaltation it was the face of a hunted and terrified thing that has gathered courage and desperation to turn and stand she defended herself with sullen defiance and denial it had come to that for ned the shepherd at upthorne had told what he had seen he had told it to maggie who told it to mrs gale he had told it to the head gamekeeper at garthdale manor who had a tale of his own that he too had told and dr harker had a tale harker had taken his friend's practice when rowcliffe was away on his honeymoon he had seen alice and greatorex on the moors at night as he had driven home from upthorne and he had told rowcliffe what he had seen and rowcliffe had told mary and the vicar and at the cottage down by the back essie gale and her mother had spoken together but what they had spoken and what they had heard they had kept secret i haven't been with him said alice for the third time i don't know what you're talking about ally there's no use your saying that when you've been seen with him it was mary who spoke i-i haven't don't lie said the vicar i'm not they're they're lying said ally shaken into stammering now who do you suppose would lie about it mary said essie would well i may tell you ally that you're wrong essie's kept your secret so has mrs gale you ought to go down on your knees and thank the poor girl after what you did to her it was essie i know she's mad to marry him herself so she goes lying about me nobody's lying about her said the vicar but herself and she's condemning herself with every word she says you'd better have left essie out of it my girl i tell you that she's lying if she says she's seen me with him she's never seen me it wasn't essie who saw you mary said somebody else is lying then who was it if you must know who saw you the vicar said it was dr harker you were seen a month ago hanging about upthorne alone with that fellow only once ally murmured you own to once you you he stifled with his fury once is enough with a low blackguard like greatorex and you were seen more than once you've been seen with him after dark he boomed there isn't a poor drunken slut in the village who's disgraced herself like you mary intervened shh papa they'll hear you in the kitchen they'll hear her ally was moaning stop that whimpering and whining she can't help it she can help it if she likes come ally we're all here poor mary's come up and stephen there are things we've got to know and i insist on knowing them you brought the most awful trouble and shame on me and your sister and brother-in-law and the least you can do is to answer truthfully i can't stand any more of this distressing altercation i'm not going to extort any painful confession you've only got to answer a simple yes or no were you anywhere with jim greatorex before dr harker saw you in december think before you speak yes or no she thought N no remember ally said mary he saw you in november he didn't where the vicar answered her at your sister's wedding she recovered of course he did jim greatorex wasn't there anyhow he was not the stress had no significance for ally her brain was utterly bewildered well you say you were never anywhere with greatorex before december you were not with him in when was it mary august said mary the end of august ally simply stared at him in her white bewilderment dates had no meaning as yet for her cowed brain he helped her in the three fields on a sunday afternoon did you or did you not go into the barn at that she cried out with a voice of anguish no 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 but mary had her knife ready and she drove it home ally ned langstaff saw you when rowcliffe came back from upthorne he found alice cowering in a corner of the couch 
and crying out to her tormentors you brutes you brutes if gwenda was here she wouldn't let you bully me mary turned to her husband stephen will you speak to her she won't tell us anything we've been at it more than half an hour rowcliffe stared at her and the vicar with strong displeasure i should think you had by the look of her why can't you leave the poor child alone at the sound of his voice the first voice of compassion that had yet spoken to her alice cried to him stephen stephen they've been saying awful things to me tell them it isn't true tell them you don't believe it there there his voice stuck in his throat he put his hand on her shoulder standing between her and her father tell them she looked up at him with her piteous eyes she's worried to death said rowcliffe you might have left it for to-night at any rate we couldn't stephen when you've sent for greatorex we must get at the truth before he comes rowcliffe shrugged his shoulders have you brought him said the vicar no i haven't he's in morph i've sent word for him to come on here alice looked sharply at him what have you sent for him for do you suppose he'd give me away she began to weep softly all this said rowcliffe is awfully bad for her you don't seem to consider what it is for us rowcliffe took no notice of the vicar look here mary you'd better take her upstairs before he comes put her to bed try and get her to sleep very well come ally mary was gentler now then ally became wonderful she stood up and faced them all i won't go she said i'll stay till he comes if i sit up all night how do i know what you're going to do to him do you suppose i'm going to leave him with you if anybody touches him i'll kill them ally dear mary put her hand gently on her sister's arm to lead her from the room ally shook off the hand and turned on her in hysteric fury stop pawing me you how dare you touch me after what you've said stephen she says i took essie's lover from her i didn't ally she doesn't know what she's saying you did say it she did stephen she said i ought to thank essie for not splitting on me when i took her lover from her as if she could talk when she took stephen from gwenda oh stephen rowcliffe shook his head at mary frowning as a sign to her not to mind what alice said you treat me as if i was dirt but i'd have died rather than have done what she did come alice come you know you don't mean it said rowcliffe utterly gentle i do mean it she sneaked you from behind gwenda's back and lied to you to make you think she didn't care for you be quiet you shameful girl be quiet yourself papa i'm not as shameful as molly is i'm not as shameful as you are yourself you killed mother oh my god the words were almost inaudible in the vicar's shuddering groan he advanced on her to turn her from the room ally sank on her sofa as she saw him come rowcliffe stepped between them for god's sake sir ally was struggling in hysterics now choking between her piteous and savage cries rowcliffe laid her on the sofa and put a cushion under her head when he tried to loosen her gown at her throat she screamed it's all right ally it's all right is it is it the vicar hissed at him it won't be unless you leave her to me if you go on bullying her much longer i won't answer for the consequences you surely don't want it's all right ally lie quiet there like that that's a good girl nobody's going to worry you any more he was kneeling by the sofa pressing his hand to her forehead ally still sobbed convulsively but she lay quiet she closed her eyes under rowcliffe's soothing hand you might go and see if you can find some sal volatile mary she said mary went and vicar who had turned his back on this scene went also into his study ally still kept her eyes shut has mary gone yes and papa yes lie still she lay still there was the sound of wheels on the road it brought mary and the vicar back into the room the wheels stopped the gate clanged rowcliffe rose that's greatorex i'll go to him ally lay very still now still as a corpse with closed eyes the house door opened rowcliffe drew back into the room it isn't greatorex he said it's gwenda who sent for her said the vicar i did said ally she had opened her eyes thank god for that anyhow said rowcliffe mary and her father looked at each other neither of them seemed to want to go out to gwenda it struck rowcliffe that the vicar was afraid they waited while gwenda paid her driver and dismissed him they could hear her speaking out there in the passage 
the house door shut and she came to them she paused in the doorway looking at the three who stood facing her embarrassed and expectant she seemed to be thinking that it was odd that they should stand there the door thrown back hid alice who lay behind it on her sofa come in gwenda said the vicar with exaggerated suavity she came in and closed the door then she saw alice she took the hand that rowcliffe held out to her without looking at him she was looking at alice alice gave a low cry and struggled to her feet i thought you were never coming she said gwenda held her in her arms she faced them what have you been doing to her all of you rowcliffe answered though he was the innocent one of the three he looked the guiltiest he looked utterly ashamed we've had rather a scene and it's been a bit too much for her he said so i see said gwenda she had not greeted mary or her father if you could persuade her to go upstairs to bed i've told you i won't go till he comes said ally she sat down on the sofa as a sign that she was going to wait till who comes gwenda asked she stared at the three with a fierce amazement and they were abashed she doesn't know steve said mary i certainly don't said gwenda she sat down beside ally has anybody been bullying you ally they've all been bullying me except stephen stephen's been an angel he doesn't believe what they say papa says i'm a shameful girl and mary says i took jim greatorex from essie and they think never mind what they think darling i must protest the vicar would have burst out again but that his son-in-law restrained him better leave her to gwenda he said he opened the door of the study really sir i think you'd better and you too mary and with her husband's compelling hand on her shoulder mary went into the study the vicar followed them as the door closed on them alice looked furtively around what is it ally gwenda said don't you know she whispered no you haven't told me anything you don't know why i sent for you can't you think gwenda was silent gwenda i'm in the most awful trouble she looked around again then she spoke rapidly and low with a fearful hoarse intensity i won't tell them but i'll tell you they've been trying to get it out of me by bullying but i wasn't going to let them gwenda they wanted to make me tell straight out there before stephen and i wouldn't i wouldn't they haven't got a word out of me but it's true what they say she paused about me my lamb i don't know what they say about you they say that i'm going to crouching where she sat bent forward staring with her stare she whispered oh ally darling i'm not ashamed not the least little bit ashamed and i don't care what they think of me but i'm not going to tell them i've told you because i know you won't hate me you won't think me awful but i won't tell mary and i won't tell papa or stephen if i do they'll make me marry him was it was it ally's instinct heard the name that her sister spared her yes 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 it is she added i don't care ally what made you do it i don't know was it because of stephen ally raised her head no it was not stephen isn't fit to black his boots i know that but you don't care for him i did i did i do i care awfully well oh gwenda can they make me marry him you don't want to marry him Allie shook her head slowly forlornly i see you're ashamed of him i'm not ashamed i told you i wasn't it isn't that what is it i'm afraid afraid it isn't his fault he wants to marry me he wanted to all the time he never meant that it should be like this he asked me to marry him before it happened over and over again he asked me and i wouldn't have him why wouldn't you i've told you because i'm afraid why are you afraid i don't know i'm not really afraid of him i think i'm afraid of what he might do to me if i married him do to you yes he might beat me they always do you know those sort of men when you marry them i couldn't bear to be beaten oh gwenda drew in her breath he wouldn't do it gwenda if he knew what he was about but he might if he didn't you see they say he drinks that's what frightens me that's why i daren't tell papa papa wouldn't care if he did beat me he'd say it was my punishment if you feel like that about it you mustn't marry him they'll make me they shan't make you i won't let them it'll be all right darling i'll take you away with me tomorrow and look after you and keep you safe but they'll have to know yes they'll have to know i'll tell them 
she rose stay here she said and keep quiet i'm going to tell them now not now please not now yes now it'll be all over and you'll sleep she went in to where they waited for her her father and her sister lifted their eyes to her as she came in rowcliffe had turned away has she said anything mary spoke yes the vicar looked sternly at his second daughter she denies it no papa she doesn't deny it he drove it home has she confessed she told me it's true what you think in the silence that fell on the four rowcliffe stayed where he stood downcast and averted it was as if he felt that gwenda could have charged him with betrayal of a trust the vicar looked at his watch he turned to rowcliffe is that fellow coming or is he not he won't funk it said rowcliffe he turned his eyes met gwenda's i think i can answer for his coming do you mean jim greatorex she said yes what is it that he won't funk she looked from one to the other nobody answered her it was as if they were all three afraid of her i see she said if you ask me i think he'd much better not come my dear gwenda the vicar was deferent to the power that had dragged ally's confession from her we must get through with this the sooner the better it's what we're all here for i know still i think you'll have to leave it leave it yes papa we can't leave it said rowcliffe something's got to be done the vicar groaned and rowcliffe had pity on him if you'd like me to do it i can interview him i wish you would very well he moved uneasily i'd better see him here hadn't i you'd better not see him anywhere said gwenda he can't marry her she held them all three by the sheer shock of it the vicar spoke first what do you mean he can't he must he must not ally doesn't want to marry him he asked her long ago and she wouldn't have him do you mean said rowcliffe surprised out of his reticence before this happened yes and she wouldn't have him no she was afraid of him she was afraid of him and yet it was mary who spoke now yes mary and yet she cared for him the vicar turned on her you're as bad as she is how can you bring yourself to speak of it if you're a modest girl you've just told us that your sister's shameless are we to suppose that you're defending her i am defending her there's nobody else to do it you've all set on her and tortured her not all gwenda said rowcliffe but she did not heed him she'd have told you everything if you hadn't frightened her you haven't had an atom of pity for her you've never thought of her for a minute you've been thinking of yourselves you might have killed her and you didn't care the vicar looked at her it's you gwenda who don't care about what she's done you mean i don't you ought to be gentle with her papa you drove her to it rowcliffe answered we'll not say what drove her gwenda she was driven she said let no man say he is tempted of god when he is driven by his own lust and enticed said the vicar he had risen and the movement brought him face to face with gwenda and as she looked at him it was as if she saw vividly and for the first time the profound unspirituality of her father's face she knew from what source his eyes drew their darkness she understood the meaning of the gross red mouth that showed itself in the fierce lifting of the ascetic grim moustache and she conceived a horror of his fatherhood no man ought to say that of his own daughter how does he know what's her own and what's his she said rowcliffe stared at her in a sort of awful admiration she was terrible she was fierce she was mad but it was the fierceness and the madness of pity and of compassion she went on you've no business to be hard on her you must have known i knew nothing said the vicar he appealed to her with a helpless gesture of his hands you did know you were warned you were told not to shut her up and you did shut her up you can't blame her if she got away you flung her to jim greatorex there wasn't anybody who cared for her but him cared for her he snarled his disgust yes cared for her you think that's horrible of her that she should have gone to him and yet you want to tie her to him when she's afraid of him and i think it's horrible of you she must marry him mary spoke again she's brought it on herself gwenda she hasn't brought it on herself and she shan't marry him i'm afraid she'll have to rowcliffe said she won't have to if i take her away somewhere and look after her i mean to do it i'll work for her i'll take care of the child oh you you the vicar waved her away with a frantic flapping of his hands he turned to his son-in-law rowcliffe i beg you 
will you use your influence i have none that drew her stephen help me can't you see how terrible it is if she's afraid of him but is she he looked at her with his miserable eyes then turned them from her considering gravely what she had said it was then while rowcliffe was considering it that the garden gate opened violently and fell to they waited for the sound of the front doorbell instead of it they heard two doors open and ally's voice calling to greatorex in the hall as the vicar flung himself from his study into the other room he saw alice standing close to greatorex by the shut door her lover's arms were round her he laid his hands on them as if to tear them apart you shall not touch my daughter until you've married her the young man's right arm threw him off his left arm remained round alice it's you shall not touch her mr carteret he said if you come between her and me i shall have to kill you i'd think nout of it don't you be frightened my lass he murmured tenderly the next instant he was fierce again and look you here mr carteret it was you who asked me to marry essie you asked me to marry essie now no essie may rot for all you care it's all right my sweetheart it's all right i'd a married essie right enough if i'd a loved her but do you suppose i'd a done it for your meddlin no and you need to ask me to marry your daughter there there my own lass you are not going to be asked said gwenda you are not going to marry her gwenda said the vicar you will be good enough to leave this to me it can't be left to anybody but ally it shall be left to her said greatorex he had loosened his hold of alice but he still stood between her and her father it's for her to say if she'll have me she has said she won't mr greatorex ay she said it to me once but i reckon she'll have me now not even now she's told you he did not meet her eyes yes she's told you she's afraid of me yes and you know why ay i know you're afraid of me ally because you've heard i haven't always been as sober as i might be but you're not half as afraid of me drunk or sober as you are of your own father you don't think i shall be half as hard and cruel to you as your father is she doesn't mr carter and that's god's truth i protest said the vicar you stand back sir it's for her to say he turned to her infinitely reverent infinitely tender will you stay with him or will you come with me i'll come with you with one shoulder turned to her father she cowered to her lover's breast ay and you needn't be afraid i'll not be sober i'll be sober enough now do you hear mr carteret you need not be afraid either i'll keep sober i'd keep sober all my life if it was only to spite you and i'll make her happy for i reckon there's nothing i could think on would spite you more you want me to marry her and punish her i know that'll do greatorex said rowcliffe ay it'll do said greatorex with a grin of satisfaction he turned to alice the triumph still flaming in his face you're not afraid of me no she said gently not now you never were said greatorex and he laughed that laugh was more than mr carteret could bear he thrust out his face toward greatorex rowcliffe watching them saw that he trembled and that the thrust out furious face was flushed deeply on the left side the vicar boomed you will leave my house this instant mr greatorex and you will never come into it again but greatorex was already looking for his cap i'll never come into it again he assented placably there were no prayers at the vicarage that night it was nearly eleven o'clock greatorex was gone gwenda was upstairs helping alice to undress mary sat alone in the dining-room crying steadily the vicar and rowcliffe were in the study in all this terrible business of alice the vicar felt that his son-in-law had been a comfort to him rowcliffe he said suddenly i feel very queer i don't wonder sir i should go to bed if i were you i shall presently the one-sided flush deepened and darkened as he brooded it fascinated rowcliffe i think it would be better said the vicar slowly if i left the parish it's the only solution i can see he meant to the problem of his respectability rowcliffe said yes perhaps it would be better he was thinking that it would solve his problem too for he knew that there would be a problem if gwenda came back to her father the vicar rose heavily and went to his roll-top desk he opened it and began fumbling about in it looking for things he was doing this it seemed to his son-in-law for quite a long time but it was only eleven o'clock when mary heard sounds in the study that terrified her 
of a chair overturned and of a heavy body falling to the floor and then stephen called to her she found him kneeling on the floor beside her father loosening his clothes the vicar's face which she discerned half hidden between the bending head of rowcliffe and his arms was purple and horribly distorted rowcliffe did not look at her he's in a fit he said go upstairs and fetch gwenda and for god's sake don't let ally see him end of chapter sixteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine